The final boss of Wing 1, Sabatha, steps up the difficulty and complexity a bit from prior encounters and will truly test your team's coordination in order to defeat her. After Gorsival, you'll have to make your way through swarms of bandits in order to reach Sabatha. Most groups will first stack behind the stairs here to lure them in and cleave them down, then head up the stairs, clear those on the platform, and continue on. Clear the area up here, and if you haven't yet, you'll notice some players are randomly being given a green sapper bomb with a special action key to throw that bomb at a ground target. What's not as clear here is that these bombs trigger launch pads like you'll see at the cliffside. After clearing the mobs, the group should stack up on the launch pad, and whoever gets the bomb should throw it on the launch pad to send everyone up, and yes, you can throw it at your own feet. If there are any stragglers in your team, you can interact with the two nearby levers to lower their platforms and make a jumping path for anyone who still needs. Finally, the group should stack in this corner to again line of sight the enemies and cleave them all down together. While you don't have to clear every enemy in this area, you have to clear enough to fill the progress bar up in your event guide before you can proceed to the boss. Before beginning, you'll need to assign three players to special jobs here. Flak Kite. This player needs to stand furthest from the boss in order to bait the fiery flak shot that Sabatha is constantly lobbing at them. This doesn't necessarily need to be a special build or anything, but it's typically handled by a ranged support class, so someone who has a bit of self-sustain. Cannons. Two players need to be assigned to cannon duty, one for the odd cannons and one for the evens. Not a bad idea if someone can volunteer for backup, too. These should be regular DPS players, since they will spend some time off-platform, and it helps if they have some instant movement skills like blink or shift signet. Additionally, these players should have the explosive launch mastery in order to avoid taking damage from this mechanic. We'll go into more details about how these work in a moment. There's no real tank here, so other than those, there are just a few mechanics that everyone should be on the lookout for. Players closest to the boss will occasionally be selected for a large point-blank AoE that drops bombs under their feet. Move this off the stack and drop them elsewhere, otherwise you will heavily damage your teammates. Also, be sure not to drop this on your flat kite. As the fight progresses, more players will get these simultaneously. Other bombs will occasionally spawn on the platform with a small pie chart timer above them. Simply run over to them and press F before they detonate. Later on in the fight, turrets will appear and should be destroyed, preferably by ranged DPS players who can pierce the boss along with the turrets, but melee DPS can very quickly and easily take care of them too. Finally, the most directly punishing mechanic here is Sabatha's Flame Wall. She will periodically perform an attack that's, well, exactly what it sounds like, a Flame Wall. It moves counterclockwise around the arena, and if you get hit by it, you die. You won't get downed, you just die. There are some profession skills that can survive it or move you through it, but don't learn this fight while relying on them. Fight with Sabatha is deceptively simple, but it requires all moving parts to go smoothly or the whole thing can quickly fall apart. The most important of which are those cannons we mentioned. Throughout the fight, cannons will appear at the four surrounding platforms and they spawn every 30 seconds. If left alone, they will shoot at and deal heavy damage to the platform and that basically becomes your enrage timer. Failing to deal with the cannons can and will destroy the platform, including your team standing on it before Sabatha dies. For this reason, cannons really can't be ignored, which is why we have players assigned to deal with them. As I mentioned, they do appear on a timer, and their pattern is fixed. Note that the community practically considers these specific markers to be a given here, so it's best to stick with this pattern. If you forget, just place arrow at south, and then drop markers 2, 3, and 4 in a clockwise pattern. Now, I'll tell you up front, you don't necessarily need to memorize this pattern, unless you're the commander or you're doing one yourself. However, you can either keep a note to the side and watch the timer, or if you have Blish HUD, the timers module nearly trivializes this by counting down the cannons for you. I highly recommend going this route if it's an option. However, if nothing else, you can just watch the minimap and the in-game timer. Cannons will show there when they spawn, and it's ideal if you can get to them as they're spawning, but you will almost always get a second sapper bomb about 15 seconds later, so you can always tackle them reactively rather than proactively. Oh, and the reason we have the two cannon enjoyers is because once you take a cannon, you get a debuff that prevents you from taking another for 50 seconds, but they spawn every 30 seconds, so you can see why we can't have just one person do them all. As for the rest of the group, we can simplify the chaos a lot by simply stacking with our backs to the upcoming cannon. So, for example, at the start of the fight, stack with your backs to the south marker, which should be arrow. This way, when that cannon is up, whoever ends up with a sapper bomb simply needs to turn around, throw the bomb, and turn back around. No scrambling to figure out where to throw it or anything. The sapper bomb is a ground target fired by your special action key, just like we saw in the pre-event. The cannoneer will then get launched off platform where they just need to kill the cannon next to them and then glide back down. If a flame wall is happening, let them know, but if you're gliding back down and you see imminent death ahead of you, there are some one-time use updrafts you can use to avoid them. 
After launching your first cannon player, the stack simply needs to move slightly so that our backs are facing the next upcoming cannon. Then your second cannon player does their thing, and then this just repeats every 30 seconds until Sabatha is defeated. Between cannons, you'll still need to manage the bombs on platform and on players, evade Sabatha's flame wall, and oh yeah, deal with her team of assistant managers. Periodically, Sabatha will leave the platform and she'll be replaced with other mini bosses. They really aren't that mechanically complex or really even worth detailing, except Knuckles. He is the second mini boss to appear, and you just need to be ready to CC him fast when his bar is up. Failing the break bar will cause him to knock everyone backwards, potentially off the platform, which has a high probability of wiping the group. But if you can keep cannons and mini mechanics moving smoothly, this fight becomes rhythmically satisfying to complete. Players essentially need to step off the stack to deal with the various different flavors of bombs in this fight, then immediately return to the stack whenever possible, occasionally running around in a circle and occasionally throwing a sapper bomb behind you. Now that you know the main strategy, let's go into a little more detail to make things move a little more smoothly. First, the very first cannon tends to pop right around the same time as the first flame wall, so your cannon one person may need to adjust their placement or timing accordingly, and run before or after the flame wall. For the flame wall itself, Sabatha actually targets a random player in the group to determine the start location of it, so it's important that the group stack tight in order to bait this and ensure that it starts in a predictable location. You can either stack slightly to the left of Sabatha and know that your cannoneer needs to run immediately after the flame wall starts, or stack just to the right of Sabatha and know that you'll get almost a full rotation's worth of time to complete the cannon launch before the wall makes it all the way around. I've been in groups that do both. I think it's just personal preference if you ask me. I've noticed this tends to happen with North Cannon a lot too, so you can employ the same strategy. Regardless, just establish if you need the group to stack to the right or if you need the cannon runner to not run to the launch pad until after the flame wall passes over. Either will work as long as there's a plan. Second, the flak kite actually does typically take on a little more responsibility than just baiting the flak shot attack. When the squad is ready, they should be the first to run in, because there will be a large bomb right at the start of the fight, and it targets whoever is closest. This allows the flak kite to bait both the first bomb and flak shot, and drop them off the center of the arena, so the group can get a smoother start. The bandit sappers will target the farthest west in-range player for the sapper bomb. I say in range to point out that it is dependent on the relative locations between banded sapper and player, but in general, this means that a flat kite can usually hang out on the west end of the platform and bait the sapper bomb. Again, not a requirement, and frankly, everyone should be able to successfully handle the sapper bomb mechanic anyway. And speaking of sapper bombs, if you're one of the cannon players, there's one more tip that might help you. When your cannon is up, you should be running over to your corresponding launch pad, obviously. But instead of running directly to the pad and waiting, hang out on the edge of the metal portion of the platform and wait until you see one of your friends get the sapper bomb, then run to your launch pad. The reason for this is if you just run to the launch pad and chill for a few seconds, you're likely to be farther from the boss than the flat kite, which means you become the flat kite, and you can very quickly cover your launch pad in burning goop. By hanging out just a little inwards until the last moment, you are much more likely to have a clear launch pad. Finally, if someone misses a cannon, there are a few decisions your group will need to make on the fly. If it was early on in the fight, you're probably best off just GGing and resetting. It's not worth the chaos right at the start of the poll. But assuming you're farther along and not resetting, there are a few things that could happen. If your cannon person died, which is usually because of the flame wall, you can employ your backup cannon person. After roughly 10 seconds, they should be ready to take the cannon that was missed, using the extra sapper bomb that you normally get between cannons. However, note that this will put everyone's rotation into backup timing, which effectively means timing for all cannons gets pushed back by about 15 seconds. This is because while your backup cannon can grab this one right away, if we were to try to adhere to the original timing after, they will likely still have their debuff by the time the next cannon is up and they won't be able to take it. In order to keep the 30 second gap between both still standing cannoneers, both will need to delay by about 15 seconds. If you're using timers, this just means that you'll end up having to take your cannon about 10 to 15 seconds after you saw the notice for it, so you'll have to pay a little more attention to the minimap, your time, or both to keep track of where to go. Now, if your cannon person didn't die, and maybe someone just failed the throw, you can still have your backup cannon go as soon as possible, which again will be around 10 seconds later using the spare bomb. However, after backup goes, return to the original rotation, because the backup cannoneer will only need to go once, and the person they're filling in for can jump back into the standard rotation next go around. For example, if cannon 1 goes and cannon 2 fails, then have backup cannon take care of the one that cannon 2 missed. Cannon 1 will take their next scheduled cannon like normal, and then cannon 2 will take their next scheduled cannon like normal, and repeat. 
But I'll be honest, guys, I've done this fight plenty of times, and sometimes if a single cannon is missed, I'll just ignore it and move on, maybe grabbing it if it's convenient for the backup to run it. If you have decent DPS, you can get away with one or two cannons up, depending on how late into the fight it is, and shifting strategies mid-fight can sometimes send things downhill if your group isn't all on the same page. This is the type of judgment call you or your commander just have to make on the fly, like a lot of encounters, but that's also why these backup strategies are worth discussing up front. Thank you so much for watching. If you found my guide helpful, please consider leaving a like or even subscribing. It really does help the channel out. And I'd love to hear your strategies for bosses like Sabbath in the comments. See you in the next one.